It was utterly hideous. There is, I, I, when I go back to that moment, I, it was a huge audience. It's a massive space just opposite the Houses of Parliament. You know, no pressure. And it, it, literally everything that went wrong could. The, the tech was down. The person I was on stage with, we hadn't done enough rehearsal. It was, really wasn't working. People couldn't hear me at the back. <laughs> I'm a voice coach. It was, it was just, just hideous. And I remember walking off that stage and going, I want the earth to swallow me up. I, I literally want to disappear. <laughs> However, if you're a voice coach and you've had that soul crushing experience, actually it makes you a really empathetic coach to people who are going through similar things. So really it was a gift. It took me a while to feel that. Hey, welcome back to the Mic Drop Moment. That's my guest on today's episode, Caroline Goida. She is a UK-based renowned voice teacher and communication expert. Her new book is called Find Your Voice, The Secret to Talking with Confidence in Any Situation. And you can find that anywhere books are sold. I definitely recommend if, if using your voice is any part of your job, whether you're podcasting, whether you're speaking, doing webinars, uh, speaking up in meetings even, if, if needing to communicate confidently is part of your job, then you should check out the book. There's a bunch of great exercises, simple ways to really get grounded and sound your best. Uh, I was really moved by it. I originally found Caroline because I read her first book, she's got three, called Star Qualities, and it was where she interviewed celebrities, uh, famous actors, about what they brought to their work. It's, it's a fun one as well. Her second book is called Gravitas, and that is closely aligned with her huge TEDx talk, which which I've watched many times and I've sent to many of my clients who needed some voice help. And her TEDx talk is called The Surprising Secret to Speaking with Confidence. And right now, uh, as of today, there's over seven and a half million views on that talk. So it's it's a great one. It's really fun, actually. We we talk about it in this episode and there's, there's a surprising... Surprising uh, guest, guest prop in it, and you'll definitely want to hear that. We talk about nipples and chest of drawers, and just trust me, you'll you'll get into it. Uh, but she has an international reputation for working uh, with people, with senior management, with organizations, with private individuals. She's worked with many years at London's Royal Central School of Speech and Drama as a voice coach before she launched her own company. Uh, she's on the media all the time, and she's she's teaching all of us how to find her voice and get confident in the world. So. Let's go into the interview with Caroline Goida. So you have a story to tell, and you wonder how to own the stage and give that killer speech that will captivate the masses. You don't just want to speak to them. You want to transform your audience. Welcome to the Mic Drop Moment. Bold conversations about public speaking, storytelling, and business that give you real-world valuable takeaways so you can craft a speech, a story, a business, and a life that the world can't stop talking about. It's time to find your mic drop moment. Here is your host, Mike Ganino. I was so I'm really curious. We're gonna get to we're gonna get to the book writing. You've written three books. We're gonna get to the the TEDx talk that has over seven and a half million views at this point, by the way, just like astronomical. But I was just curious, like what happened to and you talked a little bit about it in the TEDx talk. What what was life for Caroline like before she was an internet celebrity, an internet voice celebrity? Where were you? What led you to that moment where you gave that TEDx talk? What was what preceded that? So in a nutshell, I was the English literature student who had a bit of a dream to be an actor which when I got to drama school turned out to be the wrong dream, which is, you know, you're in LA. <laughs> it's not an unusual place to, you know, for that to be true. And, and like so many people who train as actors, I realized that actually I didn't really have what it took because acting takes a very specific skill set, and you have to be so malleable. So once you've had an actor training and you realize, actually, this is not my thing, you look around and go, well, who else in the business looks like they have a fun job? And the people I looked at were voice coaches because I'd loved my voice classes at drama school. And so I thought, well, okay, I will train as a voice coach. It turns out that that was a really good move because I just, I fell into this job that I love. And so although, yes, TEDx has changed things in lots of ways, actually, I'm still just doing the job I love. It it is just quite simple. 
That's great. And you told in the in the story in in your TEDx talk, you break it down and talk about a moment when you yourself were were in front of a whole group of people uh, at the at the central hall. And so you break down this story of a time where you walked out. And you were like, wait a second, I'm the voice teacher and literally everything goes wrong. It was utterly hideous. There is I, I when I go back to that moment, I, it was a huge audience. It's a massive space just opposite the Houses of Parliament, you know, no pressure. And it, it, literally everything that went wrong could the the tech was down the person i was on stage with we hadn't done enough rehearsal it was really wasn't working people couldn't hear me at the back <laughs> i'm a voice coach it was it was just just hideous and i remember walking off that stage and going i want the earth to swallow me up i i literally <laughs> want to disappear <laughs> However, if you're a voice coach and you've had that soul crushing experience, actually, it makes you a really empathetic coach to people who are going through similar things. So really, it was a gift. It took me a while to feel that. Yeah. And do you remember what that speech was about? I, it, was, it was about, oh, my God, I think it was about credibility and impact. <laughs> <laughs> no irony there. <laughs> It was really, the universe was really challenging you that day, wasn't it? It was awful. And I had, there was a client who was there. And I remember as I walked out, I saw her face and it was one of just pure pity. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I love it. You know, it's one of the things I love. I don't, I, when you were, when you were at, um, at Royal Central School where you did your, your acting, your master's, right? In, in acting and speech, drama and speech. Yes, that's that's right. Yeah, I, well, my master's in voice studies at Central. I trained elsewhere as an actor. Got it. And one of did was part of the the acting training in in the UK. Is it does it include improvisation? Yes, we did a fair bit of that. It's, it's, it's fun. I, it, you have this genius moment in your TEDx talk. I, I'm a I'm an improv guy. I was at Second City in Chicago and oh, wow. Improv Olympic and and you know every you know we kind of circle all the places as you as you know, and I loved in your in your TEDx talk. There's a moment where you you're having this like Beyonce hair. There's like a <laughs> fan or some wind blowing, and I mean you really do. You look like Beyonce. It's just you've got these waves, and I love that you acknowledge it because so often people don't call things out, and it's like everybody knows it's happening. And I love this moment where you just called it out and you're like, okay, it's here. Let's move on. And I just thought it was like such, it showed a real brilliance for being in front of people and being yourself and and talking to them. And I think if I think about what was going on in that moment, there were two things there for me. One is that I, I'd worked really hard that morning to be, because I'm noisy in my head. I talked to myself a lot and I knew that Partly, I went on stage after Soweto Kinch, who is, I don't know if you know him, he's the most brilliant jazz musician. And he mm -hmm. had done a, a hip hop improvisation on stage. He'd taken five words from the audience and then he'd gone off into this incredible improvisation. And so because I was the first speaker on stage, I had to be you know, I, I had to be present because he'd done something with presence which had made everybody, the hairs on the back of people's necks stand up. It was so brilliant. So I suppose I had to channel some of his spirit. And I also had been working with a stand-up comedy director called Chris Head. Not because I particularly wanted people to die in the aisles of laughter, but just because stand-up comedy directors, as I'm sure you know, are really great at sharpening lines. And Chris had been quite um, firm with me about how to deal with heckles. And although that wasn't a heckle, it was a moment that needed dealing with, which he'd been really clear about. So I, as it happened, I thought, I'm going to channel the spirit of Chris Head. And he, something came to me, which was lucky. Well, that's such a great, it's such a great, it, it, in a way, there's a masterclass in that of what people want us to be is like this most this honest version of ourselves in front of them and ignoring the reality that we all know is like a huge way of saying hey i'm not even i'm not even here with you because i'm not willing to acknowledge this happened and so it's it's a great note i think for anybody listening who is working on a a talk or working on a webinar or something like that everyone's working on a webinar these days but I, it was such a great thing about how to 
the work you did ahead of time. So working with with Chris Head and getting ready and then recognizing what was happening with the speaker before you so that when it was your turn to be in in the moment, you really were in the moment. And it wasn't just it appears so casual when you when you mention something like that, it appears so casual. But what you're saying is actually that was a lot of work and intention that went into it, isn't it? Exactly. And I suppose that's the lesson from improv, isn't it? And the lesson from comedy. I mean, I'm no expert in comedy. My few sessions with Chris don't make me that. But what I did learn from him was that what good comedians do is have that speech, that act nailed down so firmly that you can then be free to riff. It's like good jazz, isn't it? And I think that often speakers with Ted make the mistake of thinking I just have to get the script right because we learn about words and getting the words right and actually go beyond that get it so clear in your brain that you can be playful that you can be Miles Davis with it you know and in, in, in your um in your latest book you've got three books in your latest book find your voice the secret to talking with confidence in any situation you talk about memorizing and and uh, trying to memorize your script quite a bit in there. And you have a different take than a lot of, I think, voice and speech and drama people would have because your voice, your vote is don't worry so much about memorizing it word for word. Is that fair? Well, yeah, 90%. So with that TED, what when I was working on that TEDx, it felt more like um, a piece of theater in that it wasn't word for word, but it was pretty close so I think Ted speeches are they're almost poetry I mean mine isn't mm -hmm. poetry but there is a kind of you need to hit certain moments right but that's because it's going to go on YouTube and it's going to be there forever <laughs> and that, that raises the stakes if it's a normal speech that you're doing to a conference where it's less high stakes then yes just have really clear signposts know your intro and your outro to each section and in between be quite playful. I love that. Cause it feels, it feels that audiences and it, and it feels even more so like if you look back at the, the speakers of, you know, the, the beginning, I don't, the beginning of motivational speakers is probably, you know, Jesus or something. I'm not sure. But if you think about it as like, uh, we think of the big motivational speakers that that came out in the last 40 years, there was a time where what we wanted was this Herculean kind of effort. And it feels to me more and more what we want is truth. We yeah. want honesty. Yes, I really think that's true. I think, and why it's, I think there's something about the, the, the tech is so good now, isn't it? That you can hear real nuances in someone's voices on a mic on stage now. And when you watch it back on camera, you're kind of you're kind of on stage with them. So the big shouty motivational speaker thing, it doesn't work on the subtlety of that technology anymore. We we yeah, we want the intimacy. We want to be in the room with you. We want to be on stage with you, really. And especially, you know, you think about people uh, when when we when we're able to travel and be in a space with each other, it's like if all I'm doing is getting the same version of you that I could have had on a screen, then why would I fly across the country and spend the money to be in this room with you if there's not some truth in it, you know? Exactly. And it's that truth in response to the moment that really brings this alive. It's what I remember Chris saying at the time. He said, you will get the best laughs from the thing you say in response to the room that you hadn't necessarily planned to say. That's where the real laugh comes. And he was so right. And I've remembered that, you know, in everything I've done. Yeah, it's it's that it's that almost there's something improvisational about that as well because in improv, we in dealing with the real moment, it's this shared thing with the audience where they say, "Oh, that happened here right now," and I know it's not going to happen in the next room or the next time that she gives a speech. It was like that was just for us, and it creates this really I don't know. It creates like a special little moment that can't be repeated the next time you go to another city, right? Oh, and it's the beauty of of live, isn't it? You and you know as much as. I might cry now because it's so sad what's happening to theatre all over the world, isn't it? But the, the, there's something about live music, live theatre, live comedy, that electricity of a moment happening just for you, you, it's worth everything, isn't it? It's wonderful. And it's so hard to replicate right now in COVID land because we're all on screen and it's, you know, it's slightly gone. So have you been doing a lot of, 
a lot. So, so uh, spoiler alert, everybody, we're doing this podcast during during uh, quarantine time, which when this first started and I recorded an episode, I thought, OK, I'll say this because this episode might come out in a week and we might be out of quarantine. But that was foolish of me <laughs> to think that that was going to happen. So w- I'm curious your take on how does the digital version of how how does it shift things when we're showing up on screens when everybody is you know an on-air personality in a way uh when your normal job might have been going in and working you know you you popped into a meeting and talked to someone but now every single time you need to meet with somebody it has to happen on screen with microphones in your house what are you seeing as some of the challenges people are facing in talking with confidence in that situation really so there's two there's two ways to look at this. One is my experience of it and one is clients' experience of it. If we start with clients, what I'm hearing from clients is about all the classics of Zoom fatigue, getting tired voices, people not wanting um, this is funny given this conversation because I asked you can we have the camera off, right? And so I'm saying <laughs> this now, you know, people saying can we have the camera off. And I think that there is certainly something about as you said you know the pressure of being on broadcast when we're in a room and we're sharing a coffee and we're catching up on the morning and there's a kind of there's a felt sense of each other that is so much easier our brains can process that in a much more straightforward way when you're on the laptop that i you know write emails on that you know i do my accounting on that i write a book on that's much more complicated for my brain to process. It takes a lot more effort. And I think if I come back to me, my experience of this COVID age is that I love video conferencing. I think it's an amazing form, but as an introvert, I know that I have to be quite sparing with it. And I can't do 10 video conference meetings a day. I can do probably three, and then the rest is better just on voice. Hmm. It's um it's quite a demanding medium because we do become broadcasters. It feels like there's so much it feels like it requ- I find myself I mean and it, this is great you're sharing your experience with it. I find that I feel like I project so much more not just like vocally projecting necessarily, but I feel like I'm really trying to like shoot my energy through the screen and it's yeah. it's really yeah. different when you're not also getting that back from like a live audience. Exactly. It's it's that the dance that you would do in a room where you send energy out and it comes back to you threefold. It, we have it to a degree on a video conference, but it's much more diluted and it, it feeds you much less. I mean, you'll know after a, you know, a performance, you come back and you are buzzed up by the energy yeah. of the room. And I don't think anybody gets that on video conference. <laughs> In the same way. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I used to, or, and I would say this to to clients who were going out to, to because I'll work with a lot of executives who are going to go speak at a conference about their company. So it's not their job necessarily to to be a speaker, but they're going to go, you know, pitch their company in front of a big group or, or speak at a conference about something they've done. And one of the things that I always warn them about is when you're done, you're going to feel two ways. You're either going to feel really, really high and you're going to want to go like mix and mingle because you're just going to feel like you've had this huge, you know, huge high or you're going to feel completely drained like you've used every bit of adrenaline to get through that speech and then you just want to sink in your bathtub. And so (laughs) either one of those is totally okay, but recognize that it happens. And I don't really... I, you're right. I don't. I haven't thought about that, but that doesn't happen I, on Zoom or on video calls at all. It's weird, isn't it? There's less of a buzz, and I think there's a whole load of the neuroscience of voices and bodies and brains and breath. You know, we we dance with each other in a live situation, and there is a kind of there's a feeding of energy when we're all in a room together. It you know it's the resonance, it's the vibration of a space, and and when we're on a screen it's just the vibration is not the same we're not yeah. getting the same resonance it's so interesting this is one of those i want to go back and read um have you ever read antonio damasio yes oh i, I want to go book. read his i feel like somewhere in his book there's an answer to why this is we can figure yeah. this out 
Uh. He's so in, in the feeling of what happens, he's super interesting on voice. He's really, God, it's amazing. I mean, I'm not really clever enough to read it. It's kind of, <laughs> it, I say to people, but I recommend it and then say, I, I understood 70%. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I recommended a book to someone and they read it and they're like, wow, like I had to read it like three times. You must be very smart. And I was like, no, I had to read it five times. So <laughs> you're, you're better off than me. Page by page, very slowly. <laughs> yes. Lots of, lots of, uh, you know, you read some books and you just kind of go through them quickly and you say, oh, I got it. You know, I get it. I can follow along. And other ones that you read and you say, wait a second, I need to go back to this. I need to sit with this uh, page a little while and really think about what I saw here. And that's definitely one of those books. Don't miss a single mic drop. Subscribe to the mic drop moment. First book is called The Star Qualities. And it's so, I had to get a, I had to get like a, a used version here in the United States because yes. it was like out of print. And I love it. It's interviews with with the biggest names, the biggest actors and celebrities who are who are showing up in this way and creating these real feelings for people. And I, I read it probably three years ago or four years ago. I had I read it before I had watched the the TEDx talk or any of those things. I I had this this book. I was researching and found it, and I was such a big fan of that. What was what was it? First of all, what was it like interviewing so many of those people? I have such a fondness for that that book. And it's funny, it was my first book and it, it was an experience in learning how to be published. And there were things I would do differently in the writing of it. But, oh, my gosh, the experience of talking to those expert, expert actors was properly transformational. I learned so much from talking to them. And it was really interesting when the book came out how offended some people were by the notion that actors could tell you about confidence in real life. And of course, you and I know that theatre skills are the best training of all for being real in life because they teach you to centre and they teach you to listen and they teach you to be present and all of those things. But lots of people don't get that. I think probably in LA people get it more, but there's a whole segment of people in the world who who don't value an actor's skills i think what they had to say was so helpful to me in my life what was the most what if you i mean there were so many great lessons in there and you interviewed i don't know over 40 people i think were, were in this book was there one lesson that for you sat with you and you said wow that's i really needed to hear this this is the thing that really helped me do the next thing that you did there were a few people, there's one I, I was thinking about today, actually, an actor called Rufus Sewell said that he's very commonly spotted this phenomenon where they're out um, scouting for someone to be in a show he's making or a film he's making, and they will find this super cool kid who is just perfect, and they'll ask him to come on the show, and he'll turn up the next day, and he's had his teeth whitened, and he's had his hair done, and he's got his shades on, and he's made himself to be the thing he thinks they want, when actually what they wanted was him, as he was. And he said, sometimes we waste a lot of energy trying to give people what we think they want in terms of that color blue, when actually we just need to trust what we see as blue. And I think that's massive. And it speaks to what you were saying about being present on stage to what's happening in the room. And to, it's kind of like being messy. Life is messy. Life is complicated. Life is imperfect. When you show up, be you, be messy, be imperfect because that's way more interesting than trying to be perfect and and I, I I you know I I struggle with it you know still daily but I think it's such good advice it's um it's one of those those moments I, and I, I feel like people are going to go back and listen to that that little bit again because it's so true that we we go into business and this happens so often for people that want to add speaking or communicating in some way like speaking podcast or something to their to their business is they think oh who do i have to change into to become a good public speaker exactly and the real thing is we just need to get rid of all the stuff that isn't really you Yes, it's a peeling away of stuff we've learned to hide behind. <laughs> it's hard that. though. It's hard to 
it it takes work and I think it all age helps as well, doesn't it? It's much easier to say with the benefit of a few decades. <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny how how and maybe that's just you know yourself more, right? And so you say, I trust myself, I'm gonna be able to figure this out simply because you've had more life experiences. And I think you ha- you come to a point where you see that another actor in that book, Sophia Miles, said she said, I used to think that there was a book that there was a book that some of these A-list actors had where they they knew what to do. And she said, I've realized now when I walk on set that actually nobody, there is no book. Nobody knows what they're doing. <laughs> that everybody's uh, making it up, no matter who they are. Yeah, yeah. It certainly explains uh, why there are so many books published every year on different topics that we're all kind of seeking out an answer, hoping that we'll get the uh, the shortcut to success. It's time to be unapologetically you. Find your mic drop moment. What is the, you know, if, if you're thinking about, if you're thinking about somebody who says, okay, great, I want to, I want to adopt these, you know, from that book, certainly the star qualities. I want to find, I want to have gravitas, which is the title of your second book. Um, or I really do want to find my voice, the title of your third book. If someone is just starting in that journey, if someone is just saying, I realize that, that, that this is one of my challenges and because, and you do this so well in your TEDx talk, you break down what's actually going on that, that leads us to not sounding so confident and, and why the sound of our voice does that. If someone is just getting started and they're saying, you know what, I, I'm just starting to speak up in meetings or I'm just starting to get invited on podcasts. I've been kind of a secret business person and now I'm, I'm going out there. What is the, what would be the very first thing you would say? Okay, this is what you got to get. Cause this is a lifelong journey. We can constantly be getting, uh, getting training and getting better at this, but where would you say is a good starting place for someone who says, I realize that I'm not showing up as confidently as I would like? Yeah, that's a really good question. And and I go back to what I say at the beginning of Find Your Voice, which is your voice isn't lost, it's there. Mm-hmm. So there's nothing to find in some ways, but the thing that's going to help you to center into that voice is you know, as any performer knows, good discipline. And when I first got to drama school, well, actually through drama school, really, they said to me, you have no discipline. And that was absolutely the right feedback because I really didn't. And had I got that, if I'd spent five to 10 minutes every day, stretching, getting my breathing centered, gently warming up my voice, that that would have changed everything. I would have got to a the place I needed to be so much faster. So I think what I would say to people is this is just like driving lessons in the sense that it feels difficult when you start, but actually you can become a natural really quickly. You just have to find a few habits that you commit to doing with lightness, with ease, with enjoyment every single day. And if you do them every single day, for five minutes a day, you will move faster than you can believe. You know, you will change faster than you can believe, but you do have to commit to that discipline. Yeah, it feels it feels like you're saying, hey, it's in there already, so it's not going to take a, a lifetime to figure out because it's there and it wants to be heard. <laughs> it wants to, the the real sound of you, the real resonance of you wants to be heard, but it's these these exercises. And I actually love in, in Find Your Voice, there's just a ton. I mean, every every chapter has ideas and, and there's really practical things in there. So if you're listening to this and you're thinking, oh, wow, I really do want to work on this. I want to find a five minute routine for myself. Uh, I recommend grabbing grabbing Caroline's book, Find Your Voice, because there are just really easy to do. And, you know, sometimes I think we think of voice, Caroline, and we think, oh, I'm going to be doing these these crazy runs and riffs that I see actors yeah. doing. And I love it. In your book, it's it's really practical things to help people really simple, easy ideas that people can just pop in and create a five minute routine. Exactly. Because, you know, actors are like the professional athletes of voice, aren't they? If you're going out on stage at Carnegie Hall or something, then you need that real, you know, muscular warm up. But for (laughs) most of us, we, we just don't need that. So it's keep it simple, keep it light, and it will be enough for real life. 
Yeah. Yeah. Most of us are not. If, if, um, you know, if, uh, if Beyonce or, or Meryl Streep is the, the kind of Olympian, then we don't have to train like an Olympian. We can just, we can just go to the gym every day. We don't have to be Olympian level like them. I love that. Yeah, idea. We can just do our 5k or something, you know, that's enough. That's, enough. <laughs> that's, that's a good start. And, and even for me right now, the 5k sounds hard. I've been yeah. quarantining with some snacks for quite a while. <laughs> Haven't we all? <laughs> oh my gosh. It's interesting too. I'd never seen, and I've been around this world of of theater and and you know, a little bit of voice here and there as it applied to what I was trying to communicate as an actor, but I'd never seen anyone pull out uh, in your TEDx talk, the surprising secret to speaking with confidence. You had like the sexiest prop I've ever seen, Caroline. <laughs> I still love that prop. <laughs> it's so great. So did you did you uh, so you went to a maker. That's that's. I also love. I, I'm a huge fan of of languages and words, and I love. Um, I just. Uh, I love words, and so in this, uh, you called you called them a maker, which is like a. I, I'm trying to think of what would we call somebody who who makes things like that in the United States. I, maybe a carpenter or model. I don't know, modeler. But you had a maker who made you a chest of drawers that's in the shape of like a really sexy man. Yes. And it, it, and George, the weirdest thing is that I found George. I just did an internet search for, you know, Mako and George popped up and he was about a mile down the road from me in South London. And it turns out that he's a proper genius. And he now turn, he creates this, you know, sexy man's torso into cakes and all sorts of things. But it, <laughs> if someone is thinking, of, you know, if you're thinking about doing a TEDx and you're listening, forget a deck, forget slides, find a really quirky, memorable prop. Because as soon as I had that prop, and as soon as George was on board and also making things to go inside the prop, because it has drawers, and I had three objects, which we pulled, what, in, there were two objects I had to pull the man's nipples, which just added a bit of humor and was fun. <laughs> um, and, and just, it made it fun. It made it feel like, something that was playful and enjoyable and suddenly the whole talk came alive so props are the way forward so much so i, I love it I, I i agree with you that we we rely on slides so much and it's like if it's a in in the world of improv we have something that's called um you know stage image so it's like what does the whole everything that the audience is looking at what's going on in all of the corners and so often as speakers and communicators and leaders we just like rely on the slides so much but there's so much else we can do and what I loved about it is you he's 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 um not revealed at the beginning. He's covered. Uh, the the sexy chest of drawers is covered. And so there's this moment. I, and I remember when I first watched this talk, there's this moment where I thought, what is under there? What's going to happen? This is like an abracadabra moment. She's going to reveal something. And it's it's quite titill it's quite titillating. Uh, <laughs> even before you see this chest of drawers, it's like there's this excitement factor that you just don't get with a slide deck. And that is like the dance of the seven veils, isn't it? But that was Chris Head. That was the beauty of working with a stand-up comedy director because he said, no, 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 no. You can't just walk out on stage with that thing already there because that takes all the anticipation away. You have to have it covered and tease us a little bit with the reveal. And on my own, I don't know if I would have come up with that. So there's another point here, which is about work with someone who understands stagecraft because it will unlock aspects of your speech that you probably won't get to on your own. I just don't think we, we need directors in life. You know, directors are important. They see things that you don't. Yeah, it's the it's the power of of having a coach, having a director as somebody to say, hey, what if what if you just made this small adjustment? And it's this small adjustment that pulls it all together. Exactly. Without that, it just wouldn't have come alive in the same way. So yeah, the directors are everything. Well, and it's so interesting, just little decisions, right? So if if the sexy chest of drawers had been on stage but had been revealed and you didn't talk about it for two minutes, the audience would have been staring at it and wondering, when is this woman going to address it? And so it almost becomes distracting. I think I think not only was it more exciting and like a tease to the audience, but it, you would have had to address it right away if if it was a, if it was seen. It's such a it's such a great decision, really great decision. And it's amazing. I mean, you know, you know this from improv. There are things that emerge from the process of working on it in rehearsal that are 
complete light bulb moments that you wouldn't get to staring at a piece of paper or a laptop screen. So there's n there's nothing that can replace the power of rehearsing and testing and trying things out. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's great. And and then you end up with something that's you know over seven and a half million people are watching, and such a great great uh, piece to have out there in the world. And I wonder too, do you think that that the visual, just as someone scanning the video, do you think that seeing this like you know uh, sexy chest of drawers on stage that, that that actually gets people to say, wait a second, what is this about? I think I think the reason this is what I've said to people in the past. The reason that that has gone so viral is partly just that what the hell <laughs> it's not a normal ted prop is it it's it's um and there's something about that feeling of curiosity and what that makes people click yeah yeah and then it's not there at the beginning so they have to scroll through to get to the middle to find out what the hell it is it's it's genius so did you after so when you did that when you did that talk did it go was it pretty quickly that it that it kind of blew up or did it was no. it a slow roll Slow roll. I mean, I remember at first thinking, oh, well, no one's going to watch this. <laughs> but then, so there was um, a wonderful woman called Denise Graveline in, in DC who had this, and so sadly, she died a couple of years ago, but she had this website called The Eloquent Woman. And when the talk came out, she shared it. And that was such a kind and wonderful thing to do because I think then it went to her audience in the US and really globally. I mean, and and that spiked the algorithm. And you've, you know, with YouTube and Google, once you spike the algorithm, it pushes you up. Yep. You have to do something to spike it first. And and if that hadn't happened, I think it wouldn't have had half the number of views that it did. I think the title of the surprising secret to speaking with confidence is also quite good clickbait and search bait as well. Yeah, it's a, whenever, uh, so I'm the executive producer for TEDx Cambridge in uh, Massachusetts here in the US. And one of the one of the big things that we work on with the speakers is the title of the speech, because that's so much about the, and that, and the title of the speech has nothing to do with really the, the live performance, because people are showing up, you know, people show up for other reasons, but it really does make a difference on whether it goes it hits the market and people say, wait a second, what's this? I want, I want to have confidence and now I want to know the surprising secret. So I better watch this talk. Especially with this crazy chest of drawers that looks like a sexy man's chest. Exactly. It's a kind <laughs> of, it's a, it's a triple whammy. It's, it's the perfect, perfect, perfect uh, piece there. Did, did the, did Gravitas happen before or after the talk? Yeah, it happened the same year. The so same year. I, Gravitas had come out in February and I was coaching for TEDx in Brixton anyway. I'd been doing it for a couple of years. And they said, you know, you've written this book. Do you want to pitch a talk? So it was really organic. There was no real intention to do a TEDx until they offered it to me. You know, I pitched it and they said, hmm, we don't like that idea. Come back with something else. And then The Surprising Secret was born. It's so genius. It's fun. Did did uh did people who saw the TEDx talk and then reached out to bring you in? Did they did well? Did you take the sexy chest of drawers on the road? So, people have sometimes said to me, "Oh, you haven't got the chest of drawers. <laughs> but the chest of drawers isn't mine. You see, it's George's. So uh, maybe, maybe I should ask George if he'll sell it to me." <laughs> it'd be so yeah, or like a you know a little a little a little road show for the chest of drawers. <laughs> get it on wheel. I mean, it's huge and it's heavy. We practically need a van to carry it to the venue. So <laughs> it, one. Yeah, it is funny how when, uh, depending on how people come into to our, to our work, then, uh, you know, I, I have clients who will have a certain story and they'll say, oh, I got hired to go back again to the same, to the same uh, venue. You know, Google hired me again. So I need to write a new speech. And I always say, well, wait, wait, wait. We need to ask Google if they want a new speech because Google might have liked the first speech so much that they just want you to do it again. They don't want new stuff. They want the stuff that they loved you for. And so there's something interesting about, you know, if we have a, a signature story or a signature prop, how that might be something that people say, ah, where's the, where's the, sec I want to see you pull the sexy man's nipples again. <laughs> It's funny, isn't it? And we worry about repeating the same material. So it is, I think that question to ask people what they're expecting is, is really important. Yeah. Because, because imagine how disappointing it would be if they, if they loved a signature story that you told you, you had something that, that made them laugh or made them cry or really was insightful. And then they hire you to come back again. And then they're like, wait, well, 
you know, I liked it, but I really, what happened to the story about your mom? And it's like, yeah. oh, I didn't want to bore you. And it's like, no, I could hear that every time, you know? It's a hard one for speakers and creatives, isn't it? Because I think we move on, you know, and the person who did that talk in 2014 is different. Mm -hmm. And so it's that balance, isn't it, between creating new content and giving people what they're expecting. And it's quite a hard circle to square, I think, sometimes. Yeah, in a recent um, episode of the podcast, I interviewed Michelle Poehler, who has a new book out that's called Hello Fears. And she had a whole project where she did a hundred days, her, her college, uh, like the Dean of the schools as they graduated said, I dare you all to do something like a hundred times, like pick anything and do it. And she said, you know what? I've always been so fearful. I'm going to do a hundred days of like things I fear and I'm going to vlog it and create a YouTube channel. Well, then it, wow. it kind of blew up. The last thing she did was a TEDx talk. So she did a TEDx talk, um, in Texas and it kind of blew up. And so when I, when I met her at the top of the show and I said, Hey, what do you want to talk about? She's like, I don't want to talk about the hundred day project. <laughs> and I thought it, that's gotta be so interesting because every single time, you know, people meet you and it's like, Oh, the, the way I heard about you was from this thing you did. And it's like, yeah, that's a thing I did, but I've done other things. Haven't I? And the thing with the Ted talk is that it it's, because it just is there on YouTube. It's, it might be the first point of contact for people for you forever. Yeah. You know, it, it's, um, and that's the power and also the kind of the, the worry about YouTube is it's just, it, it's always going to be there. It's there forever. I think about those people like, um, like Simon Sinek or who has that start with why with the circle thing. And I think like, I wonder if there's some point where he's like, I'm not drawing another circle on stage. I can't do it anymore. <laughs> Those three circles, they're over. <laughs> they're over. I, I'm doing a new thing. So how did you, so so let's talk about that. So you moved from the the TEDx talk, it, it you know, it got shared, it went big. You you had Gravitas, the book that was kind of the lead in to that talk. It came out before the talk. And then now you've done Find Your Voice, The Secret to Talking with Confidence in Any Situation. What was the, what did you kind of realize of like, wait, there's more to do here. There's, there's some people need to hear this specific message. What was that? Was there a moment for you where you knew, ah, I've got this other thing I need to say in this, in this new book? Well, it was kind of reverse engineered in the sense that I had thought I would write another book, but then I had a, another little girl and life was quite busy. And <laughs> my editor um, was watching the success of the talk so this is a good note for people who would either like to write a book or a TEDx. If you can get your TEDx to go viral enough, then publishing houses are interested because it's proved the idea. So she said, is there anything around the content of the book that you would like, uh, the content of the TEDx rather, that you would like to write a book on? And I thought, well, yeah, there is. Because Find Your Voice is, 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 the, is the book I feel I've really found my feet with. I feel like, you know, writing books is hard and star qualities I love because it was a fun process to write. Gravitas, I was kind of working some thoughts out, but Find Your Voice feels really like my book because I had permission to write the book I wanted to because they knew the TEDx was interesting to people. And it's it's just, it's the book that if I was run over by a bus and that was it, I don't know bit of a dark thought, then I, I, I would be happy knowing at least that I've kind of said what I want to say about voice, that that's, that's what I want to say right now in 2020 about the voice. It's, and it's, it's, uh, it really is quite practical. It feels like when you were thinking about the process and putting it in, did you say, I want an average person who's feeling, who's feeling bad about showing up in a meeting, I want them to be able to read this and use it. It feels that way. Yes. And you know, where it came from really was that in my sessions, at the beginning of each session, I always get people to write down their questions, you know, so if you could know one thing by the end of today, what would you want to know? And over the years, I have just collected all of those post-its. They put them on post-it notes or sticky notes, I think we're supposed to call them, aren't they? And I've collected them up. And when I started the book, I just took out all the, the sticky notes and I looked at all the fears and the problems and the worries that people have about voice. And I wrote that book for them, for to those fears, to help people answer those questions. Because I hear almost every day of my working life, why does my voice shake when I get nervous? What do I do about imposter syndrome? 
why is it that I keep umming and I can't stop? You know, the, the, I hear them so much. I thought I'm right. I'm going to write the book that answers these questions. And it answers them in such a clear, clear way. It's not, it's not roundabout. It's not confusing. It's written in such a clear way. And then again, there are this, these really, pra- I'm just kind of fanboying over here. Let's, let's be honest, Caroline. I love it. I needed that. It's been a long week, Mike. So I, I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. It's good. So, okay. So speaking of, by the way, I think that's a genius thing for all the people that are out there who are listening, who are, who are um, speakers or dreaming of writing a book or, or even just putting out content on your own videos, your own blog, w- that whole idea that you just said of, of, querying, asking questions of your audience and then collecting those and using those as saying, okay, well, let me, let me put out ideas on this. I think that's really, really how quite intelligent and uh, such an easy way to say, well, I I know what people want to hear because they told me. And it's, it's that thing, isn't it? That when you write a book or when you write a talk, it it is so helpful to have in your head a a kind of avatar. I don't like the word avatar because it feels a bit fake but to have a person in your mind that you're talking to and I think I always for each book I have a person and I I I think about kind of talking to them and with this book I started I pretty much wrote it by speaking it first and I think that's why it's a much better book because the others I sat down and wrote like an essay this one was spoken before it was written and it it makes for a much sleeker much easier book to read well, and I think it also felt because I've read all three of them. I looked at Gravitas uh, right before I was reading Find Your Voice, and I have to say that I that it did sound that way to me. I mean, reading it, it felt like I was in conversation with you. Oh, good, and that's that's why I'm happiest with it of all of them because it it has that sense of voice. I mean, that's you know, it's funny that it's <laughs> three books to find the writer's voice, but I think speaking aloud is the way in, really. Yeah. And it's it's interesting. It's a little bit meta because you were talking about how people don't really need to find their voice, that it's it's down in there somewhere. They just need to kind of uh, dig out all the other stuff and lift it up. And it's kind of like what you're saying you did in the process of writing the three books as well. We teach what we need. You know, that's <laughs> it's always true, isn't it? And everything I teach, I'm still learning. That's just, you know, it's the way of it's the path, isn't it, to get a bit Jackie Chan. I love it. One one of the things I I've done is uh, I occasionally will tell people on social who I'm interviewing and and uh, ask what questions. And so I have a question for you from one of my one of my uh, it feels weird to say fans. It's my friend. So one of my friends is uh, has a question. Okay. So she says, uh, and this is for Terry. So she says, uh, for everyone, but women especially, it can be hard to mask your fear and project confidence. For me, my voice modulates and is a giveaway, a poker tell, if you will, of my emotions. How do you control it so that you sound confident and don't get choked up or start to sound shrill? Ooh, thank you, Terry. That is a super good question. Right. So there's a couple of things here. There's a bit about anxiety and then there's a bit about emotion. So the first thing that I think is really important to say is that Everyone gets nervous about being in front of an audience. It's so normal to be um, jolted, to have a you know a rush of adrenaline when lots of people are staring at you, whether they're on a screen or in a room. And what actors will tell you is that you have to get into peak performance psychology in that if you have relaxed your mind, body and breath before the show, you know this is an improv person, if you're calm and centered, if your breath is relaxed, if your body is grounded, then when you walk out on stage, you will be hit by the rush of adrenaline and it will improve your performance. But if you've had three tricky messages and five cups of coffee and a really difficult day, then you'll walk out on stage and it'll be a rush of adrenaline that knocks your performance. So what I would say to Terry, the first thing is, if you've got a speech or something that makes you a bit nervous, block out a bit of time before it, do some yoga, go for a walk, center your breathing, whatever gets you into your body and breath, sing along to some music, just get quiet and centered. And then when you walk out on stage, it'll feel better. I promise. Second piece is around emotion. It's basically back to what we've been talking, which is that we can't hide emotion. We'd like to think we can, but people can read it in a millisecond. So the thing I think is really important to do is to own the emotion. 
So if you are really um, emotional about something, if you're sad, if you're excited, if you're anxious, you know, say you walk out on stage and you're feeling frightened, frame it, say, wow, looking out at all of you, I realize how much this matters to me. You know, the stakes are really high here. I can feel it in my system. And if you own it and name it and bring it in, the audience admire you for your honesty and it's okay. You've said to yourself, this is okay to feel this. So anxiety, manage it, prep, emotion, own it, bring it in. I hope that I love helps. It. So perfect. And how would you how would you do the same thing if it was in a meeting, say? Because I think it's it's what I've learned is really interesting in doing this, this putting this podcast out, and even just in my in my workshops and things with people, is how often people are saying, Well, I don't want to be a public speaker. And I don't necessarily have to give a lot of presentations, but just like in an average meeting, I'm just with my peers and we're in a room and maybe the stakes are higher. Maybe they're not just that high. And that same thing happens to me. Is there anything you think in that moment where I can kind of ground my voice so that I, that I, you know, when it's my turn to speak in a meeting, even just a small thing that I, that I do it in a way that really is that I find my confidence in that moment? Well, I think all the rules for this are in improv, aren't they? Which is that great speaking in improv is really about presence and listening and i think that's just as true of a good meeting that the worst thing you can do before a meeting is be frantically checking email be distracted be just and rush in and kind of only get into the meeting five minutes later because you've stopped thinking about the last one <laughs> you know it happens a lot doesn't it give yourself a five minute window get there early you know it might be at the moment on your laptop screen get centered Think about what the people need from you, what your intention is for the meeting and show up at the meeting and just properly listen. Keep your brain quiet. Be curious about what people have to say. And then you will be guaranteed to say something in a way that others listen to because you've given them the honor of listening. Isn't that isn't that amazing? It is it is such a simple thing, and, and we don't do it. I mean, we pop up to a Zoom meeting, and it's like everyone's clicking in right at the time, and 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 we're not there. We're we're distracted, and no wonder when it's when someone you know kind of says, "Hey, it's your turn to speak, Mike." It's like, ah, oh, okay, hold on, here I am. I'm, let me think of what I'm going to say because I haven't taken that five minutes. It's so much harder now in a world of kind of constant video conferencing, isn't it? And I think. We just need to apply the same discipline of give ourselves that five minutes beforehand. And that's why I think the you know, the fewer video conferences you have in your day, the better they're likely to be. And people are just <laughs> having them, you know, eight back to back. If you wouldn't have met them in the room face to face, have a phone call. Mm. So is there any, are there any tips you have for those moments when it's just audio? So maybe I'm going on a podcast or, or maybe I'm recording a because people hate their voices, Caroline. They hate hearing themselves back for some reason. I know it's hard, isn't it? And so, well, you know, that when I work with clients who are often they're doing kind of annual results or they're broadcasting on, you know, phone for a corporate message, as I'm sure you do as well. And the first thing I will say to them is stand up. I'm standing up now because I know that it just makes it easier for me to speak and to be connected to my voice and my body and to gesture in a way that's conversational. So make it easy for yourself. Get a laptop stand or, or a standing desk and present it standing. The second thing, which I'm sure you use as well, is that when you gesture, if you use your hands as you speak, they can't see your gesture, but they can hear it. We can hear so much gesture in the voice. And there was a study about three weeks ago that showed that when we use gesture, it naturally centers our voices. It makes it more diaphragmatic. So stand up, use your arms. And smiling is a really good way to bring warmth into the voice as well. Very simple trick. It's such a simple. And it's it's funny, I actually do stand up for, I, I have a standing desk, so I'm standing up now as well. And then the other thing I realized for me is that if I don't have the mic stand, uh, like the mic arm on my, on my desk positioned right, then I'm leaning forward, which is, which is messing up my breathing. Exactly. And, and laptop screens are really tricky for that. And, and I'm thinking by the end of COVID, we're all going to have proper studios <laughs> with posh mics and posh cameras. Cause the better the tech is actually often the easier it is to be ourselves. That's the paradox of all of this. 
Yeah, that's that's interesting. It's uh puts us back in a a natural position really so that we can we can show up and not be all contorted out of shape. Laptops are terrible for posture, aren't they? They really are. And and it's interesting too. I think a lot of people don't realize how much that messes with their voice, how much that space is. And so if if you are someone out there and you're thinking, "Hi, I want to learn more about that." Um I definitely recommend uh, Caroline's TEDx talk, The Surprising Secret to Speaking with Confidence. Not only is it a great lesson, but there's a sexy, sexy chest of drawer, man. So you can check that out too. And then of course, all of the books have really great tips on those things uh, because I, I just think we shrink so much when we don't, when we don't like the way we sound. And so this is such important work that you're doing. You are, uh, you are a real hero out there, Caroline Goida. I think um, everyone should should check out everything you do because having that confidence in ourselves is really what makes our lives, isn't it? Oh, that's so kind of you to say, Mike. And it's just my really firm belief that voice is the expression of our aliveness. Voice is breath. Without breath, we don't really have anything. So if we can learn to really like and center into our voices, I just think the whole of life opens up. Wow. I can't think of a better way to end this episode than that last line from Caroline. Wasn't she awesome? Uh, I'm so moved by what she had to say and, and her reason for doing the work she does. And also just some of those tips were like really super practical and easy for us all to take advantage of. I mean, even down to like her ideas around getting a book deal and doing a TED talk. And I mean, just great stuff for, for the kinds of people that listen to the mic drop moment. So huge thanks to Caroline Goida. Check out her book, Find Your Voice, The Secret to Talking with Confidence in Any Situation. You can find that wherever books are sold. You could check out a link in the show notes here as well. And uh, thanks for listening. It means a lot to me. I would love it if you're listening to the show to just pop on over to iTunes and write that five-star review. It means a lot. Uh, Let people know what you're learning, what you're listening to, why you like it. It would mean so much to me if you could do that because it just helps more people hear the show. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you next time. This episode has ended, but your journey doesn't have to. Head on over to MikeGanino.com. Access all the resources and links that Mike and his guests shared today. And keep on crafting your own story. That's MikeGanino.com. Your audience is waiting. Isn't it time to find your hashtag mic drop moment? 